Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is December 27, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 70. Two days ago my family and I joined millions of other Christians worldwide in celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a day of family togetherness, of worship, and of joy. That's how it is for those to whom our Lord Jesus Christ is the whole reason for Christmas. And yet in our modern world the holiday called Christmas means different things to different people. To some it's just an excuse to give and receive gifts without any deeper meaning. To others the Christmas season is mainly a chance to make money from the bonanza of gift buying. And yes, there are some among us to whom Christmas is a sad time, parents who cannot afford any gifts for their children children who have no parents, lonely shut-ins to whom no one brings a word of Christmas cheer. All of us know about these things. They are the facts of life. Christmas, like the rest of life, is largely what we make of it. And my friends, in our modern world there are evil forces who have learned to use the holiday season to do us harm. It has happened before many times. Those who bear us ill will know they can always count on us to be preoccupied and vulnerable during the holiday season. This began to be used against us as long ago as 1913. That year the United States Congress ostensibly passed the legislation creating the Federal Reserve System. There was intense opposition to this unconstitutional, privately owned central banking system, but no matter. Those who wanted it simply waited until just before Christmas. Most Congressmen had gone home, including most of the opponents to the plan within Congress. The public at large neither knew nor cared about obscure financial legislation at that moment. Everyone was too busy thinking about Santa Claus, parties, and Christmas dinner to come. And so, as its Christmas gift to America in 1913, a small group of men less than a legal quorum in Congress slipped through the Federal Reserve Act. Ever since that time the United States economy has suffered continuously from that Christmas time act of betrayal. In military affairs, too, the Christmas holiday season is always a dangerous time. That is when we are most likely to have our guard down, vulnerable to surprise attack. On December 6, 1941, Thousands of American servicemen attended pre-Christmas parties in and around Honolulu, Hawaii. Everything was peaceful and life was good. There were no military alerts and all was calm. After all, it was almost Christmas. But the following morning, Sunday morning, December 7, 1941, more than 2,000 of those servicemen lost their lives. From that day onward the name Pearl Harbor has been seared forever into the mind of every American. Yes, my friends, that's how it's been time after time in the past. And that's how it's been once again during the holiday season of 1981. We are especially vulnerable this time because our usual holiday preoccupation has been compounded by mounting economic worries. During this holiday season, my friends, not one but three major crises have been set in motion. All three are helping to bring the world one step closer to NUCLEAR WAR ONE. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, the Christmas Crises for NUCLEAR WAR ONE. Topic No. 2, the American Space Shuttle Failure No. 2. And Topic No. 3, a new scandal over America's disappearing gold. Topic No. 1. During the holiday season of 1981, from around Thanksgiving until now, three major crises have besieged us. First there were all those stories about the alleged Libyan hitmen bent on assassinating top leaders of the United States Government. Second there was the military crackdown in Poland. And third, as soon as world eyes were riveted on Poland, came Israel's illegal annexation of the Syrian Golan Heights. On the surface these three crises may appear to be unrelated, 
but they are all closely related, my friends, and they are not what they appear to be. Each is a consequence of the complex secret war plan of the Joint Military Junta of the United States and Israel. Ever since early spring of this year, 1981, I have been reporting on this war plan. It's the brainchild of the American Bolsheviks and their Zionist cohorts in Israel. Briefly stated, the plan is to engulf the world in a swirling cauldron of crises so widespread that it will be impossible to prevent nuclear war. The conflicts are intended to gradually escalate until the time is ripe. Then an American nuclear first strike will be launched against Russia. Nuclear war will break out in such a way that it will appear to be accidental. America's nuclear forces will not realize that they are firing the first shots of nuclear war. Instead, they will be given false information that will trigger all-out retaliation against a non-existent Russian attack. I have given many details about all this in earlier AUDIO LETTER REPORTS. The prelude to all-out nuclear war is planned to include war in the Middle East. In the Joint War Plan of the American Bolsheviks and the Israeli military planners, the Middle East War is the responsibility of Israel. In AUDIO LETTER No. 68 I called attention to the way in which this is making Israel the eye of a growing hurricane of violence. The storm of crises is continuing to grow outward. Close to Israel the top priority is to do everything possible to destroy the Camp David Peace Accords, so-called. That's why the entity known as President Sadat of Egypt was assassinated on October 6. Likewise, the Camp David Accords were the real target in the Golan Heights Annexation. I'll come back to that later on. Moving farther out from Israel, the whirlpool of trouble has now engulfed Libya to the west and Poland to the north. Soon we'll see new flare-ups of major trouble to the east of Israel in Iran and to the south of Israel in Saudi Arabia. The first of the three Christmas crises to erupt was the one over Libya. Actually, the first trial balloons about possible Libyan assassination teams were floated in early November, but it was not until around Thanksgiving, the beginning of the holiday season in America, that Libya suddenly became the lead story in American news reports. By early December we were being told that a group of three to six hit men were thought to be in the United States. It was claimed that they were gunning for the President and several other top government officials. We were told that the threat was expected to be greatest up until Christmas, and there was a big display of increased security for possible targets. Up to now the alleged Libyan assassination threat has not been carried out, but, my friends, that does not mean that the Libyan crisis is over. In my last AUDIO LETTER No. 69 I report that Libya's Colonel Gaddafi could be programmed to behave like a madman. That's exactly what is being done right now. You'll be hearing more about the Libyan crisis in the days to come. When you do, be sure to keep your eye on the ball. Supposedly Gaddafi wants revenge against the United States. He wants revenge for the two Libyan jets which were shot down last August, supposedly by jets from the supercarrier USS Nimitz. My friends, the controlled major media are delivering a clever dose of psychological conditioning to us all. What they seem to be telling us is, watch out for a possible assassination of top American officials. But at the subconscious level they are slipping in other major ideas. One idea is, watch out for a Libyan revenge of some kind for the Nimitz episode of last August. With revenge as the excuse, Libya's Gaddafi can be programmed to do almost anything, and whatever it is, it will be big, and it will help push us closer to nuclear war. As I say these words, Libya has been pushed into the background in most American minds. The Libyan crisis has not run its course, but it has been upstaged by a seemingly greater crisis the military crackdown in Poland. For three years now the old Bolsheviks from Russia, who now control America's military policies, have been trying to trigger revolution in Poland. 
They first attempted to do this by subverting the Roman Catholic Church. In AUDIO LETTER No. 37 in August 1978 I gave a warning that there would shortly be turmoil in the Vatican. An attempt was about to be made to turn the Catholic Church strongly anti-Russian in its policies. Barely a month later the newly elected Pope, John Paul I, died unexpectedly. He had been murdered, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 39. His replacement, who became known as Pope John Paul II, was the first non-Italian Pope in 455 years, and he came from troubled Poland. The Bolsheviks within the Vatican who engineered his election wanted only his potentially anti-Russian image, not the man himself, and so he too was done away with by poisoning and replaced by a double on November 21, 1978. The new actor Pope then began issuing a steady stream of stiff statements against alleged Russian repression of Poland. In January 1979 I reported that the plan of the American Bolsheviks to use their power in the Vatican was moving fast. That month in AUDIO LETTER No. 42 I gave the details of the Bolshevik plan to set off what would be known as the Pope's Revolution in Poland. The key to that plan was to be a visit by the actor Pope to Poland the following May, the highly emotional 900th anniversary of St. Stanislaus' martyrdom was to be used as the perfect occasion to set off revolution. The Russian and Polish authorities were able to head off the Pope's revolution plan almost at the last minute. Russian intelligence was able to replace the Bolshevik actor Pope with their own double. Immediately the Vatican agreed to a one-month postponement in the Papal trip. That eliminated the emotionally charged atmosphere of the original date, and the trip went off without a hitch. Having had their Vatican intrigues foiled for the moment, the Bolshevik planters here in America started down a different route. Their agents within Poland started agitation for an independent labor union to be known as Solidarity. In the old days when the Bolsheviks themselves controlled both Russia and Poland, an independent labor union would have been unthinkable, but things have changed and are still changing in Russia and in Poland. Solidarity was granted a charter by the Polish Government in August 1980. The Bolsheviks here in America had hoped that the demand for a union charter would in itself lead to confrontation with the Polish Government. When that did not happen, Solidarity then began a relentless drive of demands, strikes, and more demands without let-up. Well over a year ago I gave a warning that Solidarity had only one purpose, and that purpose, contrary to claims, was not to serve the Solidarity rank and file, but to use them. Solidarity was created for the purpose of making conditions steadily worse in Poland until an unavoidable confrontation was created with the Government. This month it finally happened. On December 12 the Solidarity Ruling Council called for a nationwide referendum by January 15. It was to decide in effect whether the present Government of Poland would be allowed to continue at all, and the head of Solidarity, Lech Walesa, was quoted as saying, I now favor confrontation with the Government." Unquote. In effect, Solidarity had dared the Government to either clamp down or cease to exist. Barely 24 hours later martial law was declared in Poland. Here in the United States news reports and official statements are making the Polish situation look as bad as possible, even though it's actually easing right now. In important ways, my friends, the present situation in Poland reminds me of what happened in Lebanon back in 1958. As you may recall, there was a flare-up of trouble at that time which appeared to threaten the pro-Western Government there. President Eisenhower ended up sending in the United States Marines at the height of the crisis. The 1958 Lebanon crisis was big news here in America. News reports here conveyed the impression of a major crisis with widespread violence and the very fate of Lebanon hanging in the balance. Martial law was declared in Lebanon just as it was two weeks ago in Poland, and just like Poland today, 
Lebanon in 1958 was under a dusk to dawn curfew. Based on the major media news reports here, most Americans were led to believe that the 1958 Lebanon crisis was a virtual reign of terror, but, my friends, that impression was far from the truth. It was the result of deliberate overdramatization by the media. Yes, there was a crisis of sorts. That much was true, but the grain of truth was all but lost among the scare tactics and the reports by the controlled major media here in the United States. I think it's worth taking a few moments to describe what really happened in Lebanon in 1958 and how a false picture of it all was painted by the American media, because today the same kind of overdramatization is taking place in the reports about Poland, and if we Americans fall for it, we will be dragged one step closer to NUCLEAR WAR ONE. My own involvement in the 1958 Lebanon crisis began shortly before any fighting had broken out. I was in private legal practice here in Washington at the time, but I had become involved in intelligence work many years before. From time to time I was called upon to undertake intelligence activities, making use of my civilian status as a cover. The Lebanon crisis was one of those times. I was contacted by an operative of the CIA and told that an imminent crisis was brewing in Lebanon. I was given a briefing on the situation to the extent that the operative had been able to piece it together. There were indications that a full-fledged civil war was a possibility. The United States Government wanted to prevent that partly because of the very major investments in Lebanon by American business and banking interests. The operative had approached me because I knew Lebanon. I had been there before. My mission was to go there and find some way to defuse the crisis. By the time I arrived there, tensions were building between the two opposing Lebanese factions. The basic disagreement between them had to do with Egypt's then-President Nasser. Nasser wanted the Arab world to unify and throw off all vestiges of Western colonialism. To do that he had turned east for help to Russia. Nasser's appeals to his Arab brothers were very powerful. In Lebanon this led to conflict between a pro-Nasser faction and an anti-Nasser group who preferred the status quo. It was a conflict between minorities. Most of the people of Lebanon were not actively involved on either side. Even so, it did carry the seeds of real trouble if allowed to get out of hand. The conflict consisted mostly of kidnappings, both real and rumored, sabotaging of roads with oil and nails, and threats and counter-threats arising out of old family feuds. There were also a few scattered snipers and some rumors of torture, but those were never proven to have taken place. No pitched battles took place. The real problem was a growing atmosphere of fear and distrust. Lebanon has never maintained a standing army of any significance. For that reason Lebanon's then President Shamoun appealed to the United States for help in keeping order in Lebanon. President Eisenhower responded by sending in the Marines. Since I was already in Lebanon by then, I went down to the beach to watch the landing. The landing by the Marines was totally without opposition and entirely peaceful. In fact, as Marines waded ashore, they were greeted on the beach by young peddlers hawking Coca-Cola. But for the public consumption back home here in America, scenes like that were edited out from television and photographic news coverage. Instead the situation was dramatized. United States News Agency photographers and TV crews got groups of Marines to pose in dramatic, menacing gestures. They pointed their guns at imaginary enemies and in some cases even fired them to please the media crews. Civilians stood around on the beach watching it all after being shooed away from camera range. Some took out cameras to take snapshots of the goings-on, but were brusquely told that their cameras would be confiscated if they took any pictures. I was staying at the AUB Club, and one evening after that I was having dinner. As I was enjoying my kibbe, I became aware of an unusual conversation between two men at the next table. One was a reporter for the Associated Press. 
The other was his editor, that is, his boss. The reporter had written a story about the situation in Lebanon, and the AP editor was telling him how he wanted it changed. He went through it line by line from start to finish. As I eavesdropped, I could tell that the reporter's original story had been accurate and truthful. For example, he reported that the only menace which the Marines had encountered so far was diarrhea until they learned not to drink the water. He also described how the Marines were spending a lot of their time on the beach, sunbathing, reading novels, and eyeing the beautiful girls in bikinis. And my friends, that's how it really was. I saw it for myself. But the editor was not happy with that truthful news story. Instead he was instructing the reporter on how to rewrite it to give a different version by using dramatic words. He struck out words. He deleted sentences. He changed words, inserted phrases, rewrote paragraphs. By the time he was finished, the editor had twisted the reporter's story into one that painted a picture of violence, torture, and a warlike atmosphere that did not exist. Having seen and heard these media distortions in progress, I went on about my business. In the end the Lebanon crisis was resolved very simply by dollar diplomacy. By dispersing $15 million among the leaders of the so-called warring factions, the United States Government snuffed out the conflict. As one factional leader told me after the settlement agreement had been reached, quote, for another $15 million I would start another war." Unquote. When I got back home from Lebanon I was astonished to learn that my relatives and friends had been worried sick about me. They didn't know the details of my trip, but they knew I had gone to Lebanon for some reason, and they had feared for my life. When I read the newspaper clippings which they had saved for me, I could see why. The media had indeed painted a totally false picture of the Lebanon situation. The American major media had deliberately distorted their reports, even telling outright lies in order to over-dramatize. My friends, the same thing is going on right now in the reports here in America on the Polish situation. The controlled major media, working hand-in-glove with our Bolshevik Government, are seizing like vultures on every scrap of negative news, every ugly rumor that they can dredge up every unconfirmed statement, speculation, and outright lies by the Bolsheviks here. All this in order to create the impression here in America of an extreme crisis and inhumane oppression in Poland. The American Bolsheviks are trying to gold Russia into invading Poland. Meanwhile they are so frustrated that they are trying to convince us that we ought to consider martial law as the same thing as a Russian invasion. Can you imagine? Tough talk by the Reagan entity is making matters worse and scaring non-Bolshevik Government officials here in Washington. And night after night on the news we hear a drumbeat of Poland, Russia, Poland, Russia, Poland, Russia. We're being brainwashed for war, my friends. And as in all brainwashing, facts do not matter. It is only the impact that counts and the perception. All this is not to say that the situation in Poland is not grave or that there is no crisis there. Of course there is a crisis. When the so-called Solidarity Union was created in Poland over a year ago, I reported that its entire purpose was to bring on a crisis like this. And the Bolsheviks here who helped to create solidarity in Poland are using the crisis to help further set the stage for a thermonuclear war against Russia. The present situation in Poland seems to have been stopped short of outright revolution for the moment, but a revolution is essential in order to bring on Russian intervention, which in turn will be one of the pretexts for war to come. And so the Bolsheviks here are once again at work within the Vatican and now control it. If the American Bolsheviks get their way, a new version of the Pope's Revolution Plan is on the horizon in Poland. Already the Pope and Poland are linked daily in the news. The news of martial law in Poland reached the West early Sunday, December 13, 
The very next day the Begin Government in Israel launched the third Christmas crisis. On that day the Israeli Government announced its surprise decision to annex the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights lie along the northeast corner of Israel's border with Syria and are Syrian territory. They have been occupied by Israeli troops ever since the 1967 war, and more recently by Israeli civilian settlements. But under every rule of international law the Golan Heights area belongs to Syria. As always, the Begin Government defended its actions in arrogantly self-righteous terms as it made a mockery of the rule of law. Worldwide the reaction was universal condemnation of Israel, and within Israel itself there was also bitter criticism. Then on December 18 the United States announced that it was suspending indefinitely quote unquote, the allegedly new Strategic Cooperation Agreement with Israel. In response, Israel cancelled altogether the new agreement with America. By mutual agreement behind closed doors, the United States and Israel are striking an arm's length pose in public. This is to free Israel's hands to act without restraint later on. Earlier this week former Israeli Prime Minister Rabin summed it up with the words, quote, Annexing the Golan Heights is the beginning of the end of Camp David." Unquote. Rabin resigned as Prime Minister on April 7, 1977 because he wanted no part of the war plans then being developed. The joint war plan of the American Bolsheviks and the Zionists in Israel is still on track, my friends. They are shooting for Middle East war to break out before the end of summer 1982. From there, step by step, they plan to make the conflict escalate with other crises continuing to multiply worldwide. It may take many more months after that, but they are confident that they will reach their final goal, thermonuclear war by the United States against Russia. That, my friends, is what the Christmas crises of this holiday season are really all about. Topic No. 2. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 69 early last month on November 8, America was waiting for the second Space Shuttle mission to be launched. NASA was telling the public that a mission of five and a half days was planned, but I reported that the real plan was for an abbreviated flight. One possibility still being considered was the aborted takeoff plan, which I had first revealed five months earlier in AUDIO LETTER No. 65. But in my last-minute comments last month I reported that another plan had also surfaced consisting of an abbreviated orbital mission. Four days later, just after 10 a.m. November 12, the second Space Shuttle launch took place from Cape Canaveral, Florida, and that afternoon, just seven hours after launch, it was announced that the flight was going to be cut short. The secret plan for an abbreviated mission was underway. As an excuse, NASA pretended that a faulty fuel cell was responsible. My friends, the abbreviated Space Shuttle mission of last month was the legacy of the total disaster which engulfed the first Shuttle flight last April. Last April and again last month we saw and heard no part of the real Shuttle flight except the Florida takeoff. The Shuttle Columbia disaster last April was so crushing and the NASA cover-up so elaborate that I devoted my entire AUDIO LETTER No. 64 to that topic. The same theatrical techniques that were used to fool the public last April were used again last month, so I'll not go into all of that again. But I do want you to know what the military shuttle team tried to do last month and how it turned out. Last April we watched the Shuttle Columbia take off from Florida but it was a different shuttle called the Enterprise which landed in California. The Enterprise had been relabeled Columbia for purposes of deception. The Enterprise was a very special shuttle, unlike the Columbia or the three other shuttles which secretly exist. The Enterprise was a training shuttle with its cargo bay filled with rocket fuel tanks. 
Launched from the top of an airborne 747, the Enterprise was able to make short suborbital flights into space, but due to its fuel tanks it could carry no payload in its cargo bay. In the wake of the secret Space Shuttle disaster last April, the Military Shuttle Planter sent the Enterprise to Florida, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 65. Originally they were simply trying to buy time. But time is going by fast because the American Bolsheviks are on an accelerated timetable to bring on war. Arguments broke out among the military shuttle planners over the original plan to throw away a launch just to keep up appearances. A scheme was finally cooked up to use the Enterprise itself last month for a military mission. In AUDIO LETTER No. 69 I reported that a pretended computer problem would be an important factor in the deliberately shortened second shuttle flight. Sure enough, the evening before the launch there was a sudden flurry of activity at Cape Canaveral. Supposedly a data processing module aboard the shuttle, that is, part of its computer system, was misbehaving. We were told that a replacement was flown in, and we saw workmen rushing to install something aboard the shuttle. It was all going on literally at the last minute, just before the large external tank started being loaded with rocket fuel. My friends, the last-minute rush at Pad 39A that evening of November 11 was not to load a computer module as we were told. Instead, special photo reconnaissance equipment was installed in the rear deck of the crew compartment. It was arranged to look out of the two overhead windows. The Enterprise was unable to carry a spy satellite in its cargo bay, as I mentioned earlier, so instead the Enterprise itself was turned into a spy satellite. The makeshift spy apparatus installed in the crew compartment rear deck was not as good as that of a regular spy satellite, but the military planners here are desperate. It will soon be four years since Russia finished destroying all of America's spy satellites with her fleet of killer satellites. The military shuttle team were hoping to use surprise last month in order to get at least a little bit of reconnaissance over Russia. It was hoped that the Russians would consider the Enterprise to be no threat since it could not carry anything in its cargo bay. NASA also did everything it could to convince the Russians that a non-threatening orbit would be used last month. Finally, the launch time was shifted by about two and a half hours on the morning of November 12. That was intended to make it hard for any Russian Cosmos interceptors to readjust their orbits to attack the Enterprise. This last item, my friends, reflects a deadly intelligence error being made by the United States Military Shuttle Planning Team. They know about Russia's Orbital Cosmos Interceptors, the killer satellites. They also know about the first-generation Cosmospheres, Russia's levitating weapons platforms. Both were first deployed about four years ago. The American planners know that the Space Shuttle can outrun the first-generation Cosmospheres. Therefore, they believe that the orbiting Cosmos Interceptors are the main threat to the Shuttle. What they do not know so far is that Russia now has a small fleet of semi-experimental second-generation Cosmospheres. Last April there were seven in operation. Now there are at least eight. These new Cosmospheres, called Super Heavies or Jumbos, can outrun and outlift our Space Shuttle. The Russians gave NASA a very spectacular hint about their existence last April as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 64. There are some in America's intelligence community who have correctly interpreted what happened, but the Bolsheviks here who control America's military space program are refusing to believe it. They are explaining away the fragments of intelligence about the new Russian Jumbo Cosmospheres and thereby guaranteeing their own failure. When the Enterprise relabeled Columbia took off from Florida last month, there were no human pilots aboard. It was a suicide mission. The Enterprise followed an evasive curving launch just as the Columbia did last April, 
it headed far to the north toward a near-polar orbit. When it passed over Russia, the Enterprise was to be upside down with its spy cameras staring downward through the crew compartment windows. Five jumbo Cosmospheres were on hand and kept pace with the shuttle as it climbed toward orbit, but when they notified Moscow of the course it was taking, they were told not to fire. Instead, the Russian Ballistic Missile Defense Forces were alerted. The Russians know war is coming, and they decided to use the approach of the shuttle as a test drill. Nearly two years ago I reported that Russia was preparing to deploy a new anti-ballistic missile system. It's based on charged particle beam weapons fired from modified supersonic Tu-144 jet transports. On November 12, a squadron of Tu-144s were scrambled to intercept and shoot down the Enterprise. The Jumbo Cosmospheres continued pacing the shuttle from a distance as a backup if the tu 144 should fail, but they did not fail. The Enterprise swept downward from the north across the strategic Kola Peninsula. As it crossed over the White Sea, the big jets began firing upward with their beam weapons at the shuttle far above. The third beam blast tore through the midsection of the shuttle and it broke in half just behind the crew compartment and disintegrated. Here in the United States, NASA went ahead with its made-for-television space movies and followed the pre-planned script for a shortened mission. They knew within an hour after launch that the Enterprise had been destroyed. Having learned about Russia's plans last April to create an international incident with a crashed shuttle, they wanted to complete the flight in the world's eyes quickly. The shuttle landing at Edwards Air Force Base, California on November 14 was a replay of the show we saw last April, and when I say replay, my friends, I mean it literally. Those long-distance telephoto shots of the shuttle swooping in from the stratosphere were the same ones that we saw last April. NASA merely fed videotapes of the long-distance scenes from last April to the networks and added a fresh narrative to them. The only part of the landing that was live last month was the terminal portion which could be seen from the ground. The shuttle we saw land, my friends, was one of the secret new shuttles from White Sands. It had been carried aloft by the Launch 747 aircraft boosted to a modest speed and altitude by a pair of solid fuel booster rockets and then swooped down to delight the crowd. As of now, NASA claims to be planning the third shuttle flight for March 1982, just three months from now. And my friends, this time the launch may well take place on schedule or close to it. The embarrassing quandary of what to do with the Enterprise is now over with. Now a new shuttle, the third we have seen with the name Columbia on it, is at Cape Canaveral. Its cargo bay awaits a new secret military payload. My friends, this shuttle has been modified. It is armed for battle in space, but the Bolshevik military planners here refuse to understand what they are really up against, and so at Cape Canaveral another tragedy is now in the making. Topic No. 3. For eight years now the powers that be here in America have kept a blackout on the covered-up Fort Knox Gold scandal in our allegedly free press, but outside the United States there is a new upsurge of journalistic interest in what has happened to our gold. Unlike the controlled American major media, some foreign reporters have started asking questions again and some of them don't like the answers they are getting from the United States Treasury Department. Earlier this month, in its December 15, 1981 issue, a nationally circulated tabloid called The Globe published a cover story about our missing gold. It was titled appropriately, $66 billion in gold gone from Fort Knox. Unquote. The Globe appears on newsstands and supermarkets at drug stores all over the United States, but its editorial control lies outside the American blackout in Canada. 
And just two weeks ago on Sunday, December 13, an even harder-hitting article was published in England in the Sunday Express of London. It was titled, United States Probes Fort Knox Robbery. The article, written by correspondent David Markham, begins, quote, The American Gold Commission in Washington will this week begin an examination of Treasury documents to decide whether 7,000 tons of gold, enough to fill 300 lorries, has been stolen from Fort Knox, the world's biggest and most protected bullion store." Unquote. The article then reviews the basic charges which I have made together with my friend Mr. Edward Durrell, and it mentions that the Treasury is trying to refute our charges by providing certain documents to the Gold Commission. The article then zeroes in on the question of the missing 165 million ounces of Fort Knox gold that I reported on in the spring of this year. If you will recall, I urged all my listeners to send mailgrams to the entity President Reagan last spring, demanding that this be looked into immediately. Based on glaring conflicts among the Treasury's own documents, this staggering amount of gold disappeared without a trace from 1961 to 1971. Those of you who did as I asked last spring received your own evidence that this Administration, like those before it, is sitting on the gold scandal. They're continuing to cover it up, and the replies you received did not answer the question of the missing 165 million ounces of Fort Knox gold. The London Sunday Express article which I mentioned a moment ago focused in on that awesome amount of missing gold. They asked the Treasury Department to explain it, and now listen to the incredible reply they received. Quoting once again from the article, At the Treasury Department in Washington, Jerry Nysenson, Deputy Director of Gold Market Activities, said, we have investigated the claims of Dr. Beter and his supporters, and we contend that the gold was not stolen. There is no cover-up. They have misinterpreted our books. The gold was being refined into better quality gold, and those ounces just went up the chimney." Unquote. My friends, if anyone swallows that explanation, then I give up. Three hundred truckloads of gold went up the chimney? If it did, then enough gold dust should have settled out of the air to gold plate New York City. The United States Treasury Department is continuing its cover-up of what the London Sunday Express article says, quote, would amount to the biggest theft in criminal history, unquote. My friends, they are lying. And because they are lying, the Fort Knox Gold scandal refuses to die. One might think that the forces behind the ransacking of Fort Knox might want to lay low for a while under the circumstances, but no, those who stole the Fort Knox Gold have so far been powerful enough to keep it under wraps. They are so arrogant that they believe they can never be stopped, and so they are not compounding the felony with a new Fort Knox-style gold theft. It's going on right now as I say these words. The target this time is the United States Treasury Assay Office in New York City. The New York Assay Office is the Treasury's second largest depository for gold. Having successfully robbed Fort Knox, which is the biggest depository, the New York Assay Office is next in line. In late October, Rumors circulated briefly in New York City that the so-called Reagan Administration plans to close the assay office. For that reason, the rumors said that the gold there might be moved out and taken to the West Point Depository up the Hudson River from New York. An article about it was published in the New York Daily News for October 27, 1981. Treasury officials immediately denied it all saying no shipments of gold out of the New York Assay Office were imminent, but as usual, my friends, they lied. At 10 p.m. Saturday night, November 7, 1981, a secret meeting got underway at the New York Assay Office. Those present included Donna Pope, Director of the Mint, Dr. Alan Goldman, Deputy Director of the Mint, 
James Edwards, officer in charge at the West Point Depository, New York SA Office employees, and others. The entire group remained at the SA Office overnight. Then at 5 a.m. the following Sunday morning, November 8, they departed. They were accompanying the first secret shipment of gold out of the New York SA Office reportedly bound for the West Point Depository. The shipment consisted of four truckloads totaling 2.18 million ounces. Shipments have been continuing like this ever since. Every shipment leaves in the dead of night in elaborate secrecy. Everyone at the SA Office who knows about the shipments has been sworn to secrecy about them. Meanwhile the gold stock there is being depleted rapidly, four tractor-trailer loads at a time. I can report that shipments of four truckloads each left the New York SA Office on December 10 and December 11. The combined total amounted to 144 skids with 80 bars each, or over 11,500 bars totaling over 4.5 million ounces. Additional shipments of four truckloads each were scheduled for December 17 and 20. According to my latest information, there is a mad rush to complete all shipments before the end of the year. New York SA Office employees who see all this going on are being given the excuse that this is being done for security reasons, quote unquote. but that, my friends, is ridiculous. In spite of the security problems at the SA Office, which I have discussed in the past, security at West Point is vastly inferior. The West Point Depository was never designed for gold bullion safekeeping. It's mainly for the storage of pennies. It's not designed as a fortress like the New York SA Office. There's no high security gold vault at West Point. There are no iron gates, no bars, no military guards, and unlike the New York SA Office, which is situated in Lower Manhattan, the West Point Depository is isolated, totally isolated. Anything would go on there and no one would know. The point is this, my friends. The gold is supposedly being moved secretly to a location without adequate storage facilities and with very low security. In other words, it's being made easy to steal. And my friends, I have already received preliminary reports that some of this gold has already begun going to places other than the West Point Depository. Meanwhile, day by day, the economic news becomes more gloomy. America's economy, once the strongest in the world, is coming apart at the seams. The United States dollar, once as good as gold, is shriveling before our very eyes. In pretended response, our leaders are giving us nothing but theories, rhetoric, political grandstanding, and hypocrisy. They continue to paper over and cover up the root causes of our economic woes. Up to now the so-called Reagan Administration has been guilty mainly of hiding the past thefts of America's gold, but now they are compounding their guilt. A major new gold theft scandal is brewing at the New York Assay Office. The entity known as Ronald Reagan pretends to be upset over alleged mistreatment of the Polish people, and yet he is mistreating his own people in many ways. Now it's time for my last minute summary. My friends, the Christmas crises involving Libya, Poland, and the Israeli annexation of Syria's Golan Heights have nudged us one step closer to Nuclear War I. War preparations continue apace, involving the Space Shuttle and many other secret developments. Events are speeding up. Under the circumstances, I have some comments to make about the future of my AUDIO LETTER INTELLIGENCE REPORT SERIES. As you know, I initiated my AUDIO LETTER as a monthly report on cassette tape six and a half years ago in June 1975. Almost two years ago, in February 1980 my tape reports were interrupted by a near-fatal heart attack. By the grace of God I recovered enough to resume my AUDIO LETTER reports four months later in June 1980. Since that time my health has continued to improve, and today I feel that it is essentially back to normal, and yet 
You have probably noticed that these days I am no longer recording the AUDIO LETTER on a truly monthly basis. This is not because I am physically unable to do it. Instead, it's because the events taking place behind closed doors have repeatedly been delayed in coming to fruition. Rather than give you a partial report, I have waited to give you the full story. But now, as we draw closer and closer to war, events are speeding up. Some of you have asked me to release reports more often. Many of you have also indicated your interest in receiving some type of printed reports, and I cannot ignore the fact that due to the current recession more and more people who are interested feel that they can no longer afford a cassette tape. At the same time, we too are being squeezed by ever-increasing costs in this stagflation era. I have given considerable thought to how to meet these emerging needs, and I believe the time has come for a new phase in my AUDIO LETTER INTELLIGENCE REPORT PROGRAM. In this new phase, my cassette tape reports will continue on a less frequent basis, and they will be joined by a completely new printed newsletter which will be more frequent and less expensive. To be more specific, here's what I propose to do. First, my basic AUDIO LETTER cassette tape reports will continue, but on a less frequent basis. My present plan is to record AUDIO LETTER No. 71 next month, January 1982, and then quarterly after that, that is, every three months. When I record each AUDIO LETTER tape, I will try to concentrate on broad perspectives and major basic new intelligence. Second, for the first time ever, I now hope to inaugurate a brief printed newsletter soon to be known as the AUDIO LETTER UPDATE. My hope is to issue the printed UPDATE report every two weeks except when I record a tape and two holidays per year. That is, there will be 20 printed UPDATE issues per year. My printed UPDATE newsletter will be exactly what the name implies, a fast update on fast-breaking events behind closed doors. Most of the basic background you need in order to understand coming events has already been presented in my 70 AUDIO LETTER tapes, plus several AUDIO BOOK tapes. With events now speeding up, my printed update newsletter will refer you back to this information which is already available, and on that basis it will bring you up to date on the latest developments. Subscription prices for the new printed update newsletter will come to less than $10 for three months at this time in the United States and Canada. There will also be greatly reduced prices for multiple copies of any issue. Many of you have told me that you want this so that you can help spread the truth to others more quickly. You will be able to subscribe in any one of three ways. You can subscribe to my AUDIO LETTER TAPE alone if you wish receiving it quarterly after No. 71. Or you may subscribe to the Reduced Cost Printed Update Newsletter only, receiving it every two weeks with six exceptions throughout the year. Or you may subscribe to both, which I recommend if you can afford it. Incidentally, the combined price of both subscriptions, Tape plus Printed Update Newsletter, will be about the same as the tape alone in the past. For those who have paid up subscriptions to my AUDIO LETTER beyond No. 71, naturally we will make equitable arrangements to accommodate you. My friends, our business office will be in touch with you about the details concerning your subscription after I record AUDIO LETTER No. 71 next month, but for now I wanted you to know my thinking and give you a chance to respond. After a great deal of thought and consultation with my associates, I believe that this new step may be necessary. In this way I believe I can serve your needs as you have expressed them to me. Also I believe this is a way to help you to keep up with the increasing pace of life and death events. Let me hear any thoughts you may have about this new plan right away, by card or letter. I want to know your reactions before I announce my final decision about it next month in AUDIO LETTER No. 71. To make sure I get your messages as quickly as possible, please send your cards and letters to me at our business office in Maryland. The address is Post Office Box 276, 
SAVAGE, S-A-V-A-G-E, Maryland, ZIP 20763. You may enclose your thoughts to me with renewal or other orders, but please be sure to use a separate piece of paper. My friends, events are speeding up, and those events are leading toward NUCLEAR WAR ONE. But my hope and prayer is that in the coming year you and I can work together to help give the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ a chance in our troubled world. If we will do that, then we will all be doing our part to help make 1982 a happy, holy, and peaceful New Year. Until the next time, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.